and we're live. Here we go. Uh, so we are talking today about uh, Europe in the late 80s, early 90s, um, through the 90s, actually through the 2000s. Uh, we titled this Coming Together. I titled this Coming Together and Growing Apart, because at the same time, we're going to see some unification and some peaceful coming together. We're also going to see Europe continue to be fractured. Um, and while this seems kind of crazy to talk about when we're in the 90s, um, I need you to keep in mind that this is just part of Europe's history. This is part of what's been done. We've seen the map change so many times. And so looking at this as part of the big picture history, I think is important to do. Um, there's a lot of college board in this uh, discussion also. So I kind of try to throw in their words wherever I think they're relevant. Um, and so the context of this is we're talking about the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, um, and then kind of what happens everywhere from there. Um, so we are going to start in Yugoslavia. And you read a little bit about Yugoslavia uh, and, and had it in the reading guide. Um, Yugoslavia was created, just a reminder, historic context here, was created after World War I. Um, there was significant internal conflict during World War II, whether side with the Soviets or side with the Nazis and ethnic divisions. Um, during the Cold War, uh, Tito took a third way, was communist, did not align with the Soviet Union, was an unaligned nation. Uh, and Tito was really kind of able to tamp down the ethnic divisions and keep them together as a socialist state. But when socialism starts to fall apart in 1989 and then 1991, um, it, the Yugoslavia isn't going to be able to hold itself together. So if we look here at this map, we see these different republics of Yugoslavia. And essentially, we're going to see these start to fall apart. Um, and so in 1991, uh, Macedonia, which is 95% Macedonian and has no Serbs, so essentially ethnically homogeneous, they declare their independence and nobody cares. Later in 91, uh, Slovenia, 90% ethnic Slovenian, they declare their independence and nobody has any concern there. However, later in the year, Croatia, which is the yellow one here on the map, declares their independence. They have a 12% Serbian population, and this creates a problem. This is going to create a war. Um, this is going to lead to civil war, I should say, because Serbia does not want to give up Croatia. Um, the following year, earlier the following year, Bosnia-Herzegovina is going to declare their independence. They have a significant Serbian population. Um, and this is going to lead to more and more problems. Um, this is going to lead to outright war, outright ethnic conflict. I mean, pretty much the worst that Europe has ever has to offer. Um, Slobodan Milosevic was the president of Serbia. So he was the president of the Serbian Republic within Yugoslavia. Uh, his desire was for a greater Serbia. Uh, the pink on this map is what they viewed as rightfully theirs in one way or the other. Um, Serbia sieges Sarajevo, uh, which is a city within Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, the city that started where World War I started, the assassination started. Um, we're also going to see ethnic cleansing by the Serbians of Croatians and of Bosnian Muslims. So the Serbians are carrying these out, trying to essentially clean out Croatians from the Serbian-dominated areas, clean out Bosnians, um, uh, Bosnians and Bosnian Muslims from ma Muslim majority areas. Sorry, uh, and Serbia was definitely the aggressor. There's no doubt. Um, but we're also going to see reprisal ethnic cleansings by the Croatians, especially. Uh, and somewhat by the Bosnians who are trying to kick the Serbs out of their particular areas. Um, and so within just a couple years, there's 200,000 dead and four and a half million people displaced. Uh, this is the biggest humanitarian crisis in Europe since World War II. Um, if any of you are sports fans and want to connect this to, uh, to athletics, 30 for 30 has a great one. Uh, it's called Once Brothers. 
um, Vladi Divac was Serbian, Drazen Petrovic was Croatian, and they were on the Yugoslavian national basketball team. And they were essentially the second best basketball team in the world behind the United States. Um, but then as, uh, as war breaks out, this team is torn apart. These individuals are torn apart. Um, uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good watch. If you're a basketball fan in particular, uh, this is a pretty good watch. Uh, now, while this is going on, we have these organizations that are supposed to maintain peace. We have the UN, we have NATO, um, and they really do nothing. Uh, and this political cartoon just kind of really captures that feel. Um, you know, that nobody wanted to step in, nobody was willing to fight, nobody really understood what was going on. They shouldn't say nobody. Uh, a lot in the West didn't really understand what was going on. Bosnia and Serb, Croatian, who's right, who's wrong. Serbia seems to be the aggressor, but nobody's hands are clean. Um, and nobody really wants to do anything about it. Um, I think especially damning for the Western powers um, was Serbia's aggression against Bosnian Muslims. Um, you know, obviously Muslims in Europe, a minority population, a religious minority, um, and always on the outs with the majority of Europe. Uh, and they were ethnically cleansed. They were purposely targeted um, to get out of Bosnia. A um, couple other political cartoons here. I'll just uh, pause for a moment and let you look at these and think about what they're getting at. So by 1995, each group had essentially carved out uh, what we call an ethnically homogeneous enclave. Um, basically, the Serbs were in Serb areas, the Croatians were in Croatian areas, the uh, Bosnians were in Bosnian areas. They kind of gotten to their own place. Um, peace eventually came about from the Dayton Peace Accords. Uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, led them to have this, uh, led the peace talks between Bosnia, Serbia, uh, Croatia, um, and then the United States was helping this, obviously. Um, I personally kind of have the theory that they did this in Dayton, Ohio, because they figured they'd take these crazy, murderous, ethnic cleansing, um, you know, just awful people and tell them they weren't allowed to leave Ohio until they came to, uh, take, came to peace terms. And these guys were like, you Hannibal. And so they agreed to, uh, to peace settlements. Um, but that's not the end of what's going to be happening in the former Yugoslavia. Um, because then there's this little area of, Kos of Serbia. It's called Kosovo. It wasn't a separate republic, if we go back to the map here. It's not a separate republic. It's part of Serbia, but it's an autonomous province. Basically, they are... Um, ethnically different, largely ethnically Muslim, uh, they, or excuse me, religiously Muslim, ethnically Albanian, um, and Kosovar. And so they are not Serbian. The problem is this area is one of the most important historic areas to historic Serbia. And so even though over the course of the last two centuries it became less and less Serbian, Historically, it had the importance of like, for the American Revolution, imagine Boston and Philadelphia kind of rolled into one. And so it's really important. It's the historic heart of Serbia, but it wasn't really Serbian anymore. The Serbs though, even though they're fresh out of the Dayton Peace Accords, decide they want to take Kosovo. And so they begin moving in, the Serbs begin moving in, and begin a process of ethnic cleansing. And Slobodan Milosevic is thinking to himself, well, the West didn't do anything before. Why do I have to worry about them now? And the West, meanwhile, is finger wagging and saying, well, we're not going to let you do what you just did and we let you do before. Um, and the Serbian armies are moving into Kosovo, ethnic cleansing. Um, there's up to about 10,000 people killed, another almost million people displaced. Um, it's getting very ugly. 
And then finally, NATO steps up. NATO, this organization that we've been talking about the entire Cold War, the entire Cold War came and went, and NATO never really had any significant role. Um, and now the Cold War is over, and they are going to step in to try to maintain peace. Now, unfortunately, one of the ways NATO is doing this to maintain peace is by dropping bombs all over Serbia, all over Kosovo. Um, and these two cartoons really kind of give you the idea um, that while NATO is clearly trying to help, a lot of their policies were somewhat misguided um, and were hurting some of the people they intended to, uh, to help. Um, by 2003, uh, Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, excuse me, no longer exists. Uh, Montenegro is one of the last two break away from Serbia. Um, and they say they are independent. Kosovo then breaks away in 2008 um, and says they're breaking away from Serbia. That move is not recognized by either Russia, big surprise there, um, always watching out for Serbia, its younger Slavic brother, um, or by Serbia, of course, also not recognized by Serbia. Um, that's actually where the uh, situation still stands right now. Um, now, as far as the crimes that were committed in Yugoslavia, um, there was a international tribunal, uh, very similar to what we saw in the Nuremberg trials after World War II. Um, there were a whole bunch of people who were put, uh, who were arrested, who were put on trial for crimes against humanity, for genocide, uh, for all kinds of things. Uh, the leader, Slobodan Milosevic, basically made a, uh, a mockery of his trial, kept on putting it off, kept on calling other witnesses, um, and eventually actually suffered a heart attack shortly before his trial was over. Um, but uh, it's kind of an example of mixed international justice because some justice was found, um, but some was uh, proved elusive. Okay, next we are going to move from Yugoslavia on to uh, terrorism. Uh, you were given that timeline of terrorism a couple days ago to kind of give you some historic perspective. Um, I feel like we think of terrorism and we think of only things since 9-11 uh, without thinking about the reign of terror and uh, the red terror and these different state-sponsored terrorisms that we've actually studied and, and we know how they go. Um, now, the College Board talks about nationalist and separatist movements um, disrupting post-World War II peace. And one of its examples is Chechnya. Uh, Chechnya, excuse me, is this tiny republic in the Caucasus uh, that wants to break away from Russia. This is all part of Russia right here. Um, you can see it a little bit bigger here. Um, and they want to break away. Uh, the Chechenian flag is actually the, the green, white, and red. Um, and then this is the Russian flag. And so the Chechenians want to break away. Russia does not want to allow them to break away. And this was in the reading as well, briefly, uh, because the fear if they break away, then who else is going to break away? You lose the Caucasus, um, you lose the oil down here, and then what other former republics are going to break away? Um, and this is just awful, awful examples of terrorism. Um, I mean, Chechnyan militants uh, seize a school, a Beslan school, um, bring all the kids into the gym, wire the gym with explosives, um, and then eventually blow the gym. Um, but it's also countered by Russia with inhuman police and military responses. Um, the most famous example is the Moscow theater. Uh, Chechenian rebels took, uh, took hold of a, a theater in Moscow, a movie theater, uh, that had 100 and some odd 50 people in it. Um, and the Russian response to get the terrorists was to gas the entire theater, to poison gas the entire theater. Um, so it's just, uh, it's an example of the worst excesses of both terrorism uh, and state repression. Um, so uh, another example, um, oh, excuse me, I almost forgot. I wanted to bring this up too. Uh, as long as we're talking about Russian aggression, 
Um, I feel like it's pretty important to bring up what Russia has done uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Russia does not recognize Ukraine as an independent sovereign, either culture or state. Um, and in 2014, invaded the Crimean Peninsula um, of infamy in the Crimean War uh, and said they t are taking that as well as some of the eastern regions of Ukraine. And then obviously, as we've seen this last year, um, Russia has furthered its advance into Ukraine, furthered its uh, it's offensive, it's war. I mean, this is the largest war we've seen in Europe since World War II. Um, this is putting even the events in Yugoslavia um, kind of in the rear view mirror. And so um, obviously this isn't specifically going to be on the AP exam, uh, but being able to put Russia's foreign policy and desire for empire and where they are and finding their place in the world is anything to be able to do. Um, I want to jump, because it's been way too long since we have, uh, jump to Ireland. Um, again, this nationalist and separatist movement, an example is Ireland. Um, Ireland was still fighting, if you remember that reading that you did about the uh, troubles, Ireland is still fighting for independence, still wanting to get Northern Ireland free from England. Now, not everybody supports it, but a lot do. Um, and there were some major, major bombings in the 90s. I mean, this stuff is happening when I was in high school, you guys, when I was your age. Um, you know, these aren't scenes from World War II. You look at this bombed out street here. Um, and so these had, uh, you know, there was still significant violence happening. Uh, now, in 1998, uh, Bill Clinton was able to broker what he called the, what was called the Good Friday Peace Accords. Uh, which essentially brought relative peace and the, the IRA agreed to give up its weapons um, and work peacefully for uh, uh, for either independence or a peaceful arrangement. Um, uh, additionally, uh, September 11th kind of changed the dynamic in Northern Ireland because for a very long time, uh, terrorism in Northern Ireland or Irish terrorism against the Brits uh, was kind of t given tactic approval by the West um, because they were, I mean, let's just say it, because they were white, uh, because they were Irish and so much of America has Irish heritage. Um, but then after September 11th, um, all of a sudden terrorism uh, doesn't have so good of a name. And so that's going to change the dynamic uh, for the better for, for the peaceful uh, change in Ireland. Um, last place we're going to talk about separatist movement, uh, just as another example, is the Basque people. Uh, the Basque people live along the Pyrenees Mountains um, between France and Spain and both within France and Spain. Uh, they are completely separate ethnicity. They are neither French or Spanish. Uh, they speak a language that is unrelated to any language. Uh, any other language on the planet, linguistics are still trying to figure out exactly where it came from. Um, and the Basques every once in a while uh, will rise up and desire independence. Um, it's a much smaller movement because it's just a much more displaced population. Uh, they don't really have international support uh, like we see the Irish had for so long. Uh, but just another example, I mean, I think we think of Europe as this solidified place. Um, and then you just you start to think about it, and you're like, oh, Chechnya, like, oh, yeah, the Irish, oh, the Basque. Um, and then you even look at a map like this of, of different separate <laughs> movements um, that are still around. Um, you know, this nationalist issue that we started way back in January that we started talking about. Um, and even when we started talking about nationalism before winter break, like, it's not fully resolved. There's still ethnicities. Um, small groups feel they want separation from the states that they are a part of. Um, so just something to keep in mind as you're thinking big picture here um, after World War II. All right, now we're going to talk about the second half of the lecture here, the idea of coming together right now. Oh, me. So, so anyway, so um, there's the Beatles and coming together. Um, and so we're, this is more about unification. This is more about Europe's coming together process 
but then also part of this conversation has to be how they weren't totally coming together. So it's like the overall effort, but kind of falling short in some regards for that. Um, so essentially what we see uh, is from after World War II, from 1946 to 1990, excuse me, from 1946, I did say that right, to 1992, there's a pretty straightforward path of European integration. Um, it, it pretty much is enlarging, getting more involved, uh, again, just economically, but it's pretty straightforward. Starting in 95, so after the end of the Cold War in 89 and 91, um, we start seeing enlargement. Eastern European countries are joining in. We have the Schengen Agreement, which basically allows for completely open borders. From that point on, from 95 on, we're going to start seeing some setbacks. It's not a universally straight path forward. But the enlargement and the Schengen Agreement are part of the reason for the setbacks. Again, this isn't a unified club. It's This isn't just France, the Benelux countries, Germany, and Italy, which is where we started. We're starting to get to a very diverse, much uh, economically diverse, ethnically diverse club, and it's going to happen. It's going to be a little bit more convoluted than just straightforward path. Um, that's all what I was just saying there. Um, so uh, there is all kinds of uh, immigration. Hold on, did I skip a slide in here? Um, oh, so sorry, just I have them in a different order here. I think you guys might too. I apologize. Um, so the Schengen Agreement free movement across borders uh, is going to cause a lot of issues for Europe because you have um, uh, immigrants coming from poorer countries and coming into different European countries uh, and from other areas besides just European countries from, from North Africa, uh, from Southwest Asia, or the Middle East in here. and because you also have the welfare state, which anybody who is a taxpaying member of these um, European countries gets access to medical, to schooling, to all these things, there starts to build up a lot of resentment to these immigrants. Now, everything is all fine and good, and nobody has a problem when the economy is booming. But essentially, what we're going to see is as soon as there's economic slowdowns, especially after 2008, um, uh, these uh, these migrants, these immigrants are going to be targeted. Um, it's very much a, a parallel to what we see in this country. Um, nobody really cares about migrants from Mexico um, or from Latin American countries until there's an economic downturn. And then all of a sudden, everybody is up in arms about it. Um, and so you can, uh, I'll, I'll pause for a moment so you can look at these different maps and you can see what's going on here because there's a lot going on. So you can see the migration routes where people are coming from. Um, these are particularly interesting charts also because uh, these are talking about where people are from. Uh, so where the migrants are from. And you can see a lot of Eastern Europeans kind of moving slowly over to the West. You still see um, the Algerian connection with France. Um, again, East over into the West, um, North Africa into Spain. And so you see where these people are coming from and the migration that is happening. Um, and then, as I alluded to, um, and as you saw in your Rise of the Right reading that we did the other day, um, and if any of you paid attention to the elections in France the other day also, um, sorry, this is 2022 if we're watching this later, um, there are more and more right parties who are gaining influence um, in Europe. And largely they're gaining influence uh, through the uh, through anti-immigration policies and anti-immigration um, voices, um, and so that is happening really all over Europe. Um, although we did just see France and uh, Slovenia significantly reject far-right politicians in uh, in turn for much more mainstream. Um, too early to say exactly what that means, but. Uh, it's at least there right now. 
um, the creation of the euro. This is just such a great political cartoon here. If you, if you look at what it does, this is an eraser. I know some of you are familiar with like the old school erasers there. So that's the euro and it's literally erasing the borders, the economic borders. Uh, so the, the euro was launched in 1999. Uh, it was entered, the actual currency was entered in circulation in 2002. Um, and this is bringing Europe as close together as possible. I mean, they're all on the same currency. That is, except England, right? They are not. They do not go on the euro. Neither does Denmark, for that matter, but who cares? Um, but this is a very big deal. This creation of this single currency um, is a very big deal. That is um, challenging national sovereignty. Uh, but as I think this next cartoon shows, the EU as a whole, um, some people are viewing it as a house of cards, which is, of course, this metaphor for being weak, metaphor for being easily knocked down. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's there. It's a commercial enterprise. It's this economic unity, but it's not going to take much for it to fall apart because it doesn't have universal love. Um, a, a couple examples here. Um, uh, the euro as a crown over a Napoleonic Joker from the 2008 Dark Knight Batman. Um, and upon a crown of head, um, a quote from the Bible. Um, this is the Irish tiger. That's why he's green. And uh, he is denying the Lisbon Agreement, which was an agreement for further integration. You can tell he's denying because he's using some nonverbal communication as far as the European Union jumping through the hoop. I was called the Irish tiger, incidentally, because their economy was booming. Um, but the big turndown uh, is going to be in 2008. There is a housing and banking crisis in America, um, another bubble, actually. Uh, real estate and housing prices uh, artificially went up. And when they artificially go up, the bubble bursts. We've seen this story multiple times. Um, and there are a handful of poor countries that are in the euro uh, that just are not contributing. Uh, we call these countries the pig countries because they were they were taking from the general fund, but they weren't really contributing anything. They're also called the pig countries because they are uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Uh, oh, I think I just mixed up Greece and Spain, by the way. Um, yeah, this is definitely Spain, my bad. Um, so the pigs, it's a it's an acronym also. And so this is a big crisis. This is a big issue because these countries keep on pulling from the euro, uh, pulling from the general fund that every country is putting into, but they're just pulling it down. Um, and the euro hadn't had this kind of crisis before. And so um, this is actually going to lead to Germany kind of being the dominant player in Europe. Uh, Angela Merkel, she was the, uh, the head of Germany, the prime minister of Germany. Uh, female in politics, connect to Margaret Thatcher and anyone else going back to Elizabeth and Maria Theresa. Um, Germany is the dominant, they are the wealthiest, and they are kind of setting a lot of the rules um, of what's going on in the Euro from this point on because they have the economy to do so. Um, and so there's one way that I want you to consider this, one thing I want you to think about. Is it possible that this is all part of Bismarck's plan to dominate the European continent, just coming to fruition 150 years later? Yes, they lost the Bismarckian system of alliances, lost World War I, were completely detuned, saw the rise of the right, lost World War II, then were partitioned and then reunified. But now, now they are economically dominating Europe. And so it's all part of the Kaiser and Bismarck's master plan. No, but regardless, Germany was the dominant power. Now, partially because Germany is the power, dominant power, partially because Britain has never fully wanted to be in. Um, when things started to go south, there's a lot of question about Britain getting out. And this is going to bring up Brexit, um, this idea of whether they should stay in the European Union at all, whether they should get out. Um, when we're in 2016, there's still questions about this. Um, now looking at it from 2022, 
uh, they have pulled out. They, they, they exited completely. Um, it's still much to be seen of what is going to happen with that, how that is going to play out for them, how that is going to play out for other members of the EU. Um, there's two great political cartoons that kind of give two different images of Brexit. So go ahead and take a moment and talk with your partner or examine these and see what's going on here. Uh, and so what that ultimately means for the UK, that's going to have ramifications in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, um, because of EU border issues. Um, different countries are have different stances on it, whether they want to be angry at Britain, whether they want to, want to work with Britain, whether they want to continue to do business with Britain when they're out of the EU. Um, look for it to bring up issues about independence in Scotland, who overwhelmingly supported the EU, but have to go along with what Britain as a population, as a total population does. Um, so this is a big issue of sovereignty, of national sovereignty. This is kind of a re-expression of the British taking control of themselves and removing themselves from this international organization. Um, so again, there's a lot of separate threads, <laughs> threads and strands uh, running through this uh, coming together and growing apart discussion. Uh, but hopefully this helped make it uh, make it make a little more sense. All right, later.